what we're here to talk about today as we uh, we begin to deal with emerald ash borer here in Maine more and more. So um, I'll turn it over to Tony shortly, and then but first I'll also introduce. Uh, we're lucky enough to have Nate Siegert here as well. Nate will be participating in the uh, question and answer section afterwards, uh, along with uh, whatever discussion we uh, we choose to have. So thanks for joining us, Nate. And uh, Nate's a forest entomologist with the U.S. Forest Service in Durham, New Hampshire. And the primary goal of his work is to understand the behavior and ecology of forest insects and utilize this knowledge to maintain healthy, productive forests and better management of forest ecosystems. He is broadly interested in the ecological and evolutionary aspects of plant-insect interactions, population dynamics of forest insects, and invasive species biology. His current responsibilities include providing a wide range of forest health leadership and technical assistance with invasive forest insects, such as emerald ash borer and gypsy moth, to federal, state, and tribal and university partners and land managers. So thanks again, uh, Nate, for joining us as well. We look forward to, to hearing from, from both you and Tony uh, in the discussion and, and questions and answers afterwards. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Tony. Um, as far as questions are concerned, um, you can either enter your questions uh, in the chat or you can raise your hand and Tony is willing to take uh, live questions um, during his presentation if, uh, if anything appropriate arises there. Um, otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll reconvene at the end of Tony's presentation there and we will uh, you know, go over everything all at once. And for those of you that, that pre-submitted questions, uh, we asked the district foresters to to uh, provide some questions. Tony's already, you know, seen those and he's he's built a lot of those answers into the, the presentation. So um, I think that's all there is to uh, to say about that. So uh, without further ado, Tony, please, uh, please take it away. Thanks, Mike. And thanks for the opportunity to present this morning. And, and thanks, folks, for, for being inside for this. I know it's a nice day out there, although obviously a little moisture would be nice at this point. Um, so as, as Mike's introduction pointed out, you know, I, I'm not a forest entomologist, really my, my training has, of course began at University of Maine, but it's much more in silviculture and, and forest ecology. And so really the perspective I bring to this is much more from thinking about the forest ecosystem, both how it's impacted by emerald ash borer, but more importantly, kind of how do we manage and think about adapting our silviculture and our long-term strategies for these sites um, to deal with this threat. And, and so my title, putting the forest first, managing within the context of EAB, really really the point being that EAB is a huge threat, and I'm not going to belittle that in terms of what that means in terms of our ash resource throughout the Northeast and really throughout the range of all the ash species in North America. But when we're making decisions in response to that, you know, kind of the key message today will be that we're always putting long-term options first, both ecological, civil, cultural, and economic as we, we think through this. The other piece, um, if you look at kind of the, the different emblems uh, on my, my name slide there, um, I'm not a U.S. Forest Service employee. And the reason I, I put that up there is that a lot of this work really is in close collaboration with folks like Nate Siegert um, from Forest Health Protection, as well as scientists with the Northern Research Station um, like Brian Palak and others. And so um, what you'll be seeing today certainly um, is, is a mix of both my own work, but really more importantly, a lot of collaboration with others and in discussion with others on how to um, tackle this issue. And to that point, um, any questions on the behavior of BAB and various aspects of that, um, I was very relieved to see when Nate showed up. Um, there's many others on here that can speak to that and, and certainly questions related to that, um, certainly Nate can, can cover. Um, but before, before I get into talking about putting the forest first, I do think it's worth at least kind of putting this in context um, in, in what we're dealing with and, and kind of mentioning and, and certainly questions that came up prior to this and, and some of the, the, the challenges that we're dealing with as it relates to um, emerald ash borer, particularly as it, it, it links to the um, white ash resource, but I'll certainly talk about the brown ash or black ash, depending on where you hail from resource as well. But what's a bit unique about white ash, and even in Maine, although you're, the stumpage prices that have been coming out of Maine over the last year aren't as high as what we've been seeing in Vermont, and certainly New York has been really um, quite high with ash um, resources. But in general, you know, this, this is a species that we encounter a lot in our forests, um, either as, as a minor component and sometimes a fairly significant component. And it's not a species that's low value. And, and so when we're thinking about a threat to that species, there certainly are economic considerations that we need to factor in. And there's, there's certainly a lot of justification for a landowner wanting to capitalize on that before that, that opportunity is lost. And so certainly thinking through how do we balance that economics with kind of long-term stewardship on those sites? 
The other piece, and I pulled this from the, the Northern Woodland Owner Survey here in the lower right-hand corner, this is obviously before Emerald Ash Borer was found in Maine, but even at that time, um, asking landowners their level of concern regarding unwanted insect and disease damage, it's obviously something that, that, that a lot of landowners are already concerned with, and this is not unique to Maine. This is really across our region. And so when we're looking at kind of landowners' values for their land, their behavior as it respo in response to insects and diseases, certainly emerald ash borer is, is going to be a motivator. And again, some of the questions that um, folks submitted to Mike kind of pointed to this, that landowners are already asking, um, should I cut all of my ash? And one final point on that, um, there was a survey done primarily in New Hampshire and Vermont of family forest owners and asking them, you know, would they change the likelihood of wanting to harvest if there was a threat of significant mortality from an invasive insect. And 62% and of those landowners said, yes, that would motivate them um, to harvest. And so um, some of those landowners certainly would harvest anyway, but the majority um, really this was the motivating factor. And so as we intersect with more and more people that either are in an area where there is active EAB or certainly know it's in the state of Maine and, and now are thinking about it much more closely, um, we need to be kind of factoring human behavior and, and how that might influence kind of the opportunity for, for long-term options on the site. So just to kind of start off, I, I want to give us just some context um, for the uh, emerald ash, ash, ash borer as it relates to the ash resource in the Northeast. And, and all of us see these statistics thrown um, into newspaper articles whenever EAB is found somewhere else. They, they, they always want to mention how many ash trees there are in Maine or in this county or in this region. And so in New England, um, we know based on FIA data that ash makes up you know, roughly 5% of all of the trees um, in our region. But that's a pretty deceptive number given the nature of how ash exists across our landscape. And, and so this, this graph here is just showing you kind of, you know, for the three main ash species, all three of these susceptible to emerald ash borer, and, and, and I think all of us are aware of uh, black ash or brown ash being the most susceptible um, from a entomological standpoint. Um, you know, white ash by far is the most abundant ash species in our region. And when we look in at kind of importance values, so these, these hot red colors correspond with areas where ash is up to 20% of, the, of the, the basal area and density of trees at a pretty broad scale, a 200 uh, square kilometer scale. There are pockets, um, both, both in Vermont, certainly into, into parts of Western and Southern Maine, um, where white ash is a, is a pretty significant part of the landscape. And then at the stand scale, we all know we can come into pockets of white ash and rich hardwood stands, which I'll talk about a bit. Um, which can be 30 to 40 percent ash, depending on, on what we're dealing with. And so even though we have this small percentage, um, you know, white ash can be quite important at a localized scale. And then borrowing from some, some maps that Nate created, you know, if we look at the black ash resource, again, not that abundant, you know, across New England, but when we zoom into Maine, and particularly northern Maine, um, certainly a very, very significant um, part of that, that landscape. And, and as I'll mention in a moment, obviously it, extremely significant from a cultural perspective. And so when we're dealing with this threat, it's obviously on a stand-by-stand -stand basis. And, and those stands where there's a large component, that, that's certainly where we're concerned both of the ecological impact, but also have these trade-offs with it, that species making up a large economic or cultural component of that ecosystem. So I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about white ash today. And, and the reason for that is, is that when we're, we're looking at stands and stands that we typically manage and harvest trees in, you know, white ash intersects a lot with those landscapes. And, and I'll mention a bit more in a bit in terms of the, the habitat types and, and where we think of white ash being an important species. But a lot of the guidance when it comes to silviculture that I'll talk about and that it, that's been really issued for the region um, deals with white ash and kind of finding ways to either maintain it as part of these stands or at least think about you know, what, what the impact might be of losing that, that species from the landscape. And so across New England, you know, we have about 1.9 billion um, cubic feet of, 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 of white ash, and the vast majority of that is in northern hardwood forests. And, and, and so when we're, we're thinking about this resource, and again, uh, many of you intersect with this in your, own, in your own work, you know, it's often in those northern hardwood sites, and in particular on those rich northern hardwood sites. And so I've used the, the FIA type grouping here to break these into maple basswood and maple beech birch. And so I'll talk a little bit later, but these would be what we considered, you know, enriched sites, um, you know, where you have a significant sugar maple component, but also these are sites where you often can have on average 25, even sometimes 40% of the volume being occupied by white ash. So, and, and what this really speaks to, as many are familiar with, both white ash as well as, as black ash um, are, are fairly uh, meaty in their nutrient requirements. They actually need fairly high levels of nutrients. And so um, where we see the species, we often are assuming some type of enrichment um, on that site. In our more matrix northern hardwoods, so sites where sugar maple might not be as competitive relative to beech, 
Um, we certainly also see white ash, but it's less of a major component in those systems relative to our, our really rich sites. So even though I'm going to talk about white ash quite a bit, um, when I think about emerald ash borer, and I, and I realize many of you are certainly acutely aware of this, um, and the impacts of emerald ash borer as it intersects with kind of human uses of that, 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 that species and that genus, you know, really the, the, the greatest impact of emerald ash borer in Maine and certainly across um, the range of, of, of the ash species in North America will be the, the cultural impact of emerald ash borer. And, and as I mentioned, um, emerald ash borer, you know, unfortunately black ash or brown ash, um, again, I, I, I went to forestry school in, in Maine, but I've spent a lot of time elsewhere working with black ash, so I always have to remind myself to refer to brown as well. Um, you know, the, the cultural importance of that species really um, it isn't just, you know, restricted to Maine. Um, really, throughout the range of, of, of black ash, any indigenous tribe that intersects with that species, um, and then even beyond uh, via trade and exchange, you know, this is a species that is central to cultural lifeways, traditions. And, and so, you know, when we think about losing the species from the landscape, yes, there's ecological impact, there's economic impact, but um, really do not want to belittle at all the cultural impact, and, and we'll certainly talk a bit more about that, and, and even the, certainly the lands that I that I sit on today, um, the Wabanaki people, um, certainly you know it's central to, to the livelihoods and, and, and cultural aspects of, of the people in Vermont as well. And so um, I'll talk about black ash a little bit later, but my emphasis on white ash out of the gate today really is because this is the resource that we're typically managing and, and, and harvesting and thinking about management decisions with with landowners. So what I'm going to do is go through uh, a few highlights from some work that really was the genesis of, of several meetings and workshops over the past several years that included folks from the state of Vermont, uh, folks from New Hampshire, as well as folks from the Forest Guild um, and elsewhere that really were trying to grapple with um, how do we deal with the threat of emerald ash borer to primarily northern hardwood forests, but more broadly um, forests in the northeast. And so I'm not going to go through Every one of these 10 recommendations, some folks have likely seen this before, but if you Google this, you can find the PDF. And it's just kind of a short summary of some considerations to have as, as we're, we're dealing with this issue on the landscape. And again, um, you know, not just written by myself, but certainly others, um, both within, within our, our state agencies, uh, land trust, as well as the guild. But the, the point being that, you know, really trying to holistically think about how do we address the threat of emerald ash borer and do it in a way that that does put the forest first and certainly thinks about integrating both our traditional understanding of silviculture with um, emerging understanding of, of, of biocontrol and insecticides and some of the other tools that exist um, for dealing with this threat. So the, the first point of, um, of, of this and really in general, and you, you saw it from my, my title slide is that, um, and in my second slide, I'm, I'm not going to belittle that, you know, and, I, and I'll even say it was, it was bizarre for my first few years being in Vermont. We were the one state surrounded on all sides by states with emerald ash borer. And for some reason, nobody was too worried about it until it finally was found in Vermont and then everybody flipped out and was like, we need to be cutting ash and, and, and getting ash out because of this species and because of this impact. And so, you know, with these threats and, you know, they're certainly novel um, and, and this is a, this is an insect, you know, as, as Nate and others can attest to, that can cause significant mortality and, and really, you know, functionally eliminate a species from an area. And so there's certainly this fear of, of, the, of that threat that really can often cloud our, our vision of what might be long term stewardship on the site. And so. Um, one of the things that I often point out, and you know, even you know, we're looking at this beautiful, rich northern hardwood site, you know, this bomber ash, you know, that you don't want to just look at that stand, you know, with just emerald ash borer on your brain. Yes, you want to be factoring in emerald ash borer in these areas, and and you certainly can be harvesting ash because of the threat of emerald ash borer, but that you want to be thinking about this within the context of how is that going to impact and intersect with long-term stewardship objectives on these sites. And so it's perfectly fine to try to capture that economic value, but doing it in a way that actually is thinking about long-term options. And that's certainly something I'll talk quite a bit about for the next next portion of this presentation. And so the reason I bring that up, and, and this is thankfully really softened um, in the past couple of years, but you will still see it perpetuated here and there. And, and um, I, I know it when Mike was out in, in Minnesota, I can't blame him for these, these recommendations, but um, the initial recommendations that really were emphasized and not just proximate to emerald ash borer outbreaks or within an area with an active infestation, but really we're, we're kind of distributed as, the, as the, the, the main like thing to do with ash anywhere. And you can see these are these are from Minnesota, um, my former employers. So I, I guess, um, you know, I, I can criticize them now that I'm no longer there. I criticized him while I was there too. I'm not, this was definitely one that, that, that hit, hit home as a silviculturist. Um, but there were guidelines that, you know, no matter where you are, whether you're in York County or Piscataquis County, you know, that if the stand has ash in it, um, what you should be doing is trying to take out 
ash and, and definitely take out large diameter ash. And, and really, just to kind of zoom in on this, you know, we, from a civil cultural perspective, you know, those of us that kind of work in this realm, you know, that this notion of really targeting, number one, a single species, and then, and then number two, two, more importantly, an individual size class within that species, um, really gave us quite a bit of concern, you know, over what the impacts might be on the future value of those stands ecologically and economically. And so um, this did perpetuate throughout many states and including even some of the initial guidance out of New Hampshire had aspects of this. Um, and, and one thing I want to point out is this is actually makes perfect sense when you're in an active outbreak and, and, and actually using things like trap trees and insecticides and, and trying to contain that outbreak and, and actually proved effective um, in some areas in containing an active outbreak. But this is not something we want to be doing hundreds of miles away from EAB. This is not going to be leaving options on the site. And so when we think about what I just described there, what we call phloem reduction, right? So trying to reduce the phloem um, of, of, of ash in a stand, you know, all of us in forest management have always been in the business of phloem reduction, whether it's an ash tree or a red spruce or a white pine. But when we're doing phloem reduction in the context of, of emerald ash borer, we want to be doing it thoughtfully. And, and we don't want to be discriminately just harvesting big trees out of a stand, you know, and I'll channel I guess my inner Ralph Nyland, you know, all of us have been hearing Ralph for decades say we should not be cutting out just a big, big diameter trees. And, and, and Laura Kennefeck will tell you the exact same thing based on the work at the Penobscot Experimental Forest. We know this is not good long term stewardship. And so if we're going to be you know, cutting out large diameter ash, let's do it as part of a regeneration harvest that's really thinking about future outcomes in terms of regeneration and future stand quality. And so um, you know, I, I recognize, thankfully, this hasn't been perpetuated as much recently, but you still will come across it as a strategy. It's really meant to be kind of an integrated pest management strategy proximate to an outbreak or in an active outbreak. Um, it's not meant to be doing this across the landscapes of Maine um, to somehow stop the AB. It's, it's proven this has not slowed the species down um, in terms of its spread across the region. And so we want to make sure we're, we're being thoughtful flow and reducers as opposed to doing what, what any civil culture instructor would would start crying about if you put as an answer on their exam. So when we're thinking about thoughtful flow and reduction, um, a lot of how I emphasize uh, thinking about emerald ash borer in the context of our forests, especially um, with white ash, but also with black ash as well, is that um, yes, we may be losing trees to emerald ash borer, um, or we may be losing trees because we're preemptively cutting them. And, and one of the goals, you know, with that that removal and that mortality is that we're hoping we're keeping future options on the site for ash. And 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 that hope is really that down the road, um, whether it be via biocontrol or some other unexpected dynamic um, in, in relation to the insect itself, um, that we ultimately can have ash as a component of our forest and not necessarily have to worry about emerald ash pour down the road. And so the only way that we're going to have ash in our forest without major effort of like collecting seed and replanting and so forth is that we keep those options on the site. And so a lot of um, the recommendations we're going to talk about really are figuring out ways that if we're harvesting <laughs> ash in response to emerald ash borer, that we still can keep ash in those stands to some degree. And, and, and so because of that, the emphasis I'll make is that ash is very rarely, with the exception of our black ash resource, found as a pure species. And so because ash is a minor component of these forests, we need to start sorting out, well, if I'm gonna cut this nice ash, which is definitely into a product class that's you know, still quite competitive, how do I maintain future ash options on this site that's also dominated by things like sugar maple and other species? And, and likewise, on this ash here that's on a site with beech. One, one quick question to make, make sure, sure folks haven't already fallen asleep with my, my talking here. What's going on here? Is this emerald ash borer on this, this, this white ash right here? This, you see this? My cursor is what, what, what's anybody know? It's it's not being caused by emerald ash borer. Anybody want to type in the chat? What's causing that? Pretty pretty common on on white ash, and leads to a lot of uh, false false call alarms that that make Mike and Nate and Allison and others phones ring. Anybody know what that is? Yeah, Morgan, it's a it's a fungal, it's a bark disease, um, and so it, it's a type of but it's actually a yeah, smooth patch, smooth bark, which is caused by, by uh, uh, fungus. So um, it's it's not caused by uh, uh, emerald ash borer or, or the woodpecker activity associated with that. And, and, and one thing about this too, I'm not going to get too much into it, but when we're looking for, you know, blonding activity, typically the, the first activity is in the upper crown um, where, you know, where, where you're going to see kind of the initial um, larval activity and so forth of the insect. And so that blonding is usually up and then kind of moves its way down the tree. Um, in, in this case, you often see this smooth smooth patch 
um, you know, being being caused kind of on the on the upper bowl, but not all the way up into the crown. So this is this is being caused by by, by fungi. So there, there's certainly many many false creators of of uh, blonding on on ash. All right. So in terms of the the white ash resource, uh, both in both in Maine, but 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 also really throughout the, the range of of the species, whether you're in Michigan or or in in, in northern Vermont or in in, in northern Maine. When we think of white ash um, and the sites where it's most common, um, really it's our northern hardwood resource. And so when we want to evaluate kind of managing for the species in, in those areas where we may have both the, the most issues with emerald ash borer as well as the most opportunity to keep it as part of our landscape, um, really it's within our northern hardwood types. And in particular, um, those, those areas within northern hardwood types where there's high levels of nutrients. As I mentioned, um, white ash is a, is a very needy species in terms of nutrient um, status. So these are the two primary natural communities, um, depending on you know which which system you use. Um, rich northern hardwood, some people might call this maple basswood, and then this is this is a unenriched northern hardwood. Some people might call um, beech birch maple, right? Kind of the, the predominant um, northern hardwood type um, outside of areas where you actually have really really nice bedrock. And so in both these types of communities, you can have white ash um, in these enriched sites, so where you have bedrock with calcareous um, you know elements to it. Um, ash can exist anywhere on those sites. It doesn't need to be in a localized area um, of, of nutrient accumulation. And so as an example, here's an enriched site. You can see the, the stinging nettle um, in the understory here. And, and there's just you know, white ash throughout this site um, along with sugar maple, very, very rich um, communities. At the same token, we can have really poor bedrock. So think granitic, granitic based bedrock, but localized areas of enrichment in those landscapes. And, and those of you that are Students of Bill Leak, which which should be any of us that want to work in, in the forest of the Northeast, um, know that you know Bill Leak's work has shown really nicely that you know depending on landscape setting in these in, in, in an area with poor bedrock, you can still get localized enrichment um, and toe slopes and kind of these benches where nutrients will accumulate and create kind of these hot spots for for high nutrient concentrations. And so this picture here in the middle um, is from the White Mountains, and this is a you know very poor bedrock. But this is a toe slope um, that's accumulated nutrients over time. Here are those soils. I mean, wh and white ash is actually a pretty common component of this this enriched pat patch of, of of forest. So it's not dominant across that landscape, but it's but it's dominant in these localized areas. So um, certainly another place where we find that. And then also those of you that are that are logging in from southern Maine and, and other parts of Maine where you have transition, you know, hemlock hardwood community types. Um, like, like in York County, it can also be a component of those. And, and likewise, um, even in some mesic oak and hickory communities, um, you'll find, find white ash um, as well. But in terms of the forest types that we see it most common, it really is that northern hardwood type across the region. So if we want to do thoughtful flow and reduction, and that, and that what, what I mean by that is we're going to cut ash um, for, for various reasons, but, but often being driven by economics and, and, again, kind of concern over human safety or just concern over, over losing that species. One of the key elements, if we want to actually recruit new white ash um, with that flow and reduction, is that it needs a lot of light. Um, and, and it's a bit deceptive in that um, when, we, when we look at um, you know, these understory conditions in these stands, oftentimes we'll see these areas where um, there's a lot of seedlings. And, and, and Martin's comment is absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's found throughout these mixed community types. So I'm, I'm not going to say it's not found in other areas um, in, in the region. Um, and in all those those types, you know, occasionally what you will see are these pockets of, of ash seedlings um, that are a bit deceptive in that it might leave you with the conclusion that, wow, this is a shade tolerant tree that um, you know, I don't really need to worry too much about in terms of light availability um, when, when re regenerating it. But the, the opposite is actually the case in that um, white ash is a bit unique in that when we look at the Silvix manual and, and kind of think about the ecology of the species, um, it's generally rated as mid-tolerant or intermediate of shade. But that's actually quite deceptive in that it's a species that um, is really shade tolerant when it's small, like, you know, up to your ankle in height. But once it gets to be a bit larger um, and is released from competition, it really needs a ton of light, actually similar levels of light um, that paper birch or, or even pin cherry might need. So it really has um, extremely high light requirements. And so one of the concerns, and I'll talk about it a bit more, is that if, if we just you know, selectively cut ash out of a stand or if EAB kind of selectively removes that, we might not have the light availability to, to recruit um, future ash on, on that site. And so what we're looking at here um, are, are two, two dynamics going on. One, we have a you know basically an anchor patch cut, 
um, and and you know the ash seedling is scrim. I mean, as you those everyone knows. I mean, white ash can it's incredible on um, the levels of growth that that species can do. Um, that's a detriment um, when you have high deer densities because often it's browsed preferentially just because it's popping up above that regen. So certainly can be a challenge. But overall, as a species that really can get growing quite rapidly in these openings. But if you were to return to this opening, you know, 50, 60 years later, you'll likely have one or two ash that is successfully recruited just given you know, there's just not enough light to sustain a you know, full, full kind of pure cohort of ash in those openings. And the way we know this is by kind of re revisiting a lot of these old patch cuts um, that folks have done and tracked over time. And what you're looking at here, this is a 66 year old patch cut on the Bartlett Experimental Forest that was a half acre in size. And the majority of that cut is regenerated back to beech and sugar maple and, and what you would expect. And there's one kind of ash stem or kind of split ash stem that also kind of recruited into that gap. But, but you're not seeing kind of pure ash um, in these openings, even though there was actually a pretty large component of that stand prior to that. And so again, um, it just speaks to the, the light requirements of the species and the need to factor that in if we're gonna be trying to recruit future ash. So at least you know, two tenths to a half acre in size um, at, as a minimum. And so, how does this intersect with emerald ash borer? Um, you know, this picture here on the left is kind of if we have a mixed hardwood stand, and you know, we all know how ash kind of sits in these stands. It's not an understory tree species. It's typically up above or in that main canopy with a very low leaf area, um, just given the nature of, of how white ash grows. This tree dies, and the canopy opening it's creating is quite small. And all of us can imagine within you know five years, this is going to be completely closed by the expansion of these trees in the midstory. And so with EAB selective removal, that tree is being, being killed. But also, um, if I were to go into that stand and just cut out the ash and not think about long-term regeneration, I am not creating the light environment needed for that species to regenerate. And so if I want future ash on the site, which again is at least my perspective um, and, and others' perspective is, is how we should be thinking about this threat, you know, not only dealing with the mature trees that are being impacted, but also leaving future options for, for future mature ash trees, there's two things I need to factor in. One, are there ways for me to actually keep some existing mature ash, so seed producing ash on that site? And then also when I'm cutting out some of that ash and capturing that economic value, am I doing it in a way that's creating opening sizes large enough to recruit future white ash? And when we're talking about that, again, we're, we're getting into regeneration methods like group selection, um, certainly low density shelter woods, as well as regular shelter wood approaches that have that flexibility and the light availability that those species um, would need to regenerate. Just to kind of point that out with some some recent travels uh, that this this winter and, and this is in Vermont, so I'm not picking on any 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 forester or or, or landowner in, in Maine. I'm not um, this picture on the left. Um, these these are actually adjacent. There's a there's a property boundary between these two these two pictures, and this picture on the left um, is a rich northern hardwood site, and all of the ash was removed. There was no silviculture prescription. It was is remove all the ash. And obviously, you know, there's, there are trees still out there, right? It's not like, you know, the complete wanton destruction of the landscape, but those that are starting to pay attention to stem forms and certainly composition, essentially, you know, they've, they've left what was the mid story of, of, of sugar maple. Many of these are pretty poorly formed. So I'm, I'm excited for the, the firewood cutters in this part of Vermont um, on future harvests. And, and, and what it's also done is create this kind of patchy distribution of, of light and availability. This is what I mentioned about the phloem reduction. You don't really think much about regeneration when you're just cutting out big trees, right? You're just cutting out big trees and, and they, might be, they might be in groups, they might be singly located. And so overall, if I were to rate kind of the, the, the availability of this site for future ash regeneration, there are very few spots of any, you know, where ash is gonna be able to, to recruit, let alone other species like yellow birch and, and uh, paper birch. On the adjacent parcel, you can see the, the white ash um, in the stand. This hasn't been cut, so who knows? Maybe they'll deviate from the paint, but I, I know the, the forest, right? I don't think so. And, and this is an ash tree that's marked to leave. Um, there's another ash tree off, off, off screen here, same deal. It's a low density shelter wood, you know, that they are removing a lot of that ash volume, but they're also retaining some ash on that site just as future seed source, future legacies, you know, the, those trees may die um, and so become more of an ecological value than economic value. But you know they're doing it in a way that's thinking about both the regeneration environment they're creating, so certainly both ash and yellow birch are going to do well, um, and also they're leaving behind some residual stems and, and structure that's going to be kind of workable in the future, as opposed to on the left. And so, trying to think through, you know, that that contrast, you know, do I just remove ash or do I use silviculture to kind of think about long-term options in the site? And then obviously, um, my vote is on on the latter. 
So we've been working with, with Nate and others, um, primarily in, in Vermont, but also a bit in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Hampshire to kind of look at areas that um, have been harvested um, in response um, to em the emerald ash borer threat and to look at kind of what's coming back in these areas after um, the trees are removed. And so these are just some preliminary kind of summaries. There's not statistics. I'm just showing you kind of the proportional abundance of regeneration, um, both seedlings and saplings um, between unharvested stands with an ash component and harvested stands. And on the left, um, is the seedling layer, not much compelling there. You know, these are these are northern hardwood sites. The majority of seedlings, whether it was harvested or not, is sugar maple. And you'll notice there is a low white ash abundance in, in the seedling layer, um, whether it's harvested or not. But what's important is we think about what's going to actually make it into the canopy um, in the context of white ash. None of the seedlings um, in those harvested stands are likely going to make it to the canopy if you have shade tolerant competitors like beech and sugar maple um, on that site. And so what we're seeing, you know, with the areas that are harvested is that it actually is providing opportunity, particularly those that are using kind of larger regeneration openings to increase the amount of white ash saplings kind of recruit a new cohort of white ash while also certainly recruiting things like yellow birch, paper birch that are also of interest on these sites. And so when we've kind of broken this out by just, you know, thinning out the, the ash, really the recruitment is primarily sugar maple and beech. And that's kind of what you would expect. Um, and, and so again, if, if our goal is to diversify these stands and, and include white ash as part of that, um, larger openings certainly seem to be the way to go on, on these areas. So many are already aware of this, this wonderful fun fact that um, I, I regret bringing up because every time I do, I think it becomes harder for me to tell the difference between a female and male uh, ash tree because uh, everyone wants to ask me this question now. But, but many are, are, are aware of this, that um, ash, all of the ash, ashes are dioecious. So the, the, the male and female uh, flowers are born on separate trees. And so when we're, we're, we're thinking about retaining ash on a site, as I mentioned, retaining mature ash, um, if there's the ability to actually determine, particularly that you have a female ash on your site, uh, priority should be given for trying to retain that seed bearing individual. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. First off, we want ash regeneration. And so having that, having that female tree on the site is, is going to be critical for that. But more importantly, the, the, the male trees are actually much more frequent um, in their occurrence, about a seven to one ratio. And so because of that, um, you know, if you see a female ash tree, and you know you have a female ash tree. Um, there's a pretty good likelihood there are male ash trees, and obviously that pollen cloud is, is flying throughout um, the air and so forth, um, providing opportunities for pollinization, even if there is no male ash tree right next to um, the female ash tree. And so um, thinking about, you know, even sexing the, the, the ash trees you have out in the forest, as I mentioned, easier said than done. Um, but when you do have a good ash seed year, um, which was two years ago um, throughout much of at least Vermont and New Hampshire, um, a couple of ways you can tell uh, whether it's a female or a male, certainly um, you, you will see the, the seeds uh, late in the season. You can kind of see this, this, ye this yellowish um, crown and, and you can see this actually the Samaras in this female ash here in the right. The following year, often what you'll see on female ash, uh, you can actually still see the seed stalks um, for, the, for, the, for those um, Samaras on the tree. Um, they'll kind of retain um, all the way through the winter. Um, so you can actually kind of pick those out on, on trees in the winter. But it is it is super hard, and so um, if you see seeds, I would I would just go with that as your as your gut. But it is pretty tricky. In an urban setting, um, one one unique way to sex trees. Uh, some some people are probably familiar with this, but um, there is a spider gall mite that actually only infects the the male flowers of of ash, and so you'll see these galls um, on male ash trees, primarily in street trees. Um, but it's a it's, it's it's specific to the flowers of males, and so if you if you see this on on an ash tree that you're, you're walking around. In a neighborhood or somewhere that that's uh, that's being caused um, by a by an insect, but easier said than done. If you see seeds, get excited about that tree, and if you have the opportunity to protect it, then it's a tree to protect. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, I am not uh, an entomologist, but I get excited about entomological data that can help support um, ideas around maybe not cutting everything or thinking about um, variation and, and how we're doing things across the landscape. And and as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, of the three ash that are quite common in, in Maine and, and throughout the Northeast, um, black ash, unfortunately, is not shown to be resistant at all, uh, most susceptible um, to emerald ash borer. Green ash, there's been some evidence of what they call lingering ash, um, you know, in, in, in some areas, but it's still a very low percentage of, of you know, it's less than 5%. But white ash, and, and many are aware of this because it's certainly made, even made it into Northern Woodlands Magazine um, a couple 
about a year ago. Um, there has been some work um, with, with folks that they certainly worked a lot with out of Michigan State, Deb McCullough's group, that's resurveyed um, areas that have, that have been exposed to emerald ash borer for you know, over a decade and have looked at um, kind of survival of white ash very close to the epicenter, at least of the, the American, um, the first infestation of the AB. And so what you're looking at here is kind of the proportion of ash trees that, that were alive in these resurveys. And they've also had some, some additional papers that have come out looking at phloem area in these areas and kind of how that's influenced um, behavior of EAB. And, and what you can see is that, you know, some of these areas, you know, almost 100%, in some cases, 100% of the white ash are still alive. And whereas other areas, very importantly, no, are, no white ash are alive. And so the, the important point is there are still areas where the, where the white ash is getting creamed and, 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 and getting killed. And so we can't expect that all white ash um, are going to survive and that even in a given stand that any white ash are going to survive. But there is some evidence that there's certainly some, um, thanks, Gary, for, for correcting me on my, on the, on the, the gall, I might, um, I told you I'm not an entomologist and definitely confirm that. Um, there, there is some, some evidence, uh, you know, in these stands that in particular, they're, they're kind of intermediate sized ash trees. These are, uh, this is in, in Michigan. These are kind of old field, um, you know, second growth ash, um, with it's very different than, than some of the, the circumstances where ash exists in Maine. But generally, those stands that were kind of at a moderate density um, and those trees that were kind of intermediate in diameter for the most part um, seem to be surviving. And, and it's not that EAB was ignoring these trees. Um, they were actually um, kind of attacking the trees and the trees were responding to that. And so it's, it wasn't like there was a resistance in terms of, you know, that they were just avoiding the trees outright. Um, and so there, there is evidence of, of, of resistance. And as a point, you know, I, just saying that if you leave an ash tree behind, it's not 100% um, if it's a white ash, that tree's going to die. And so certainly if there are objectives that include the ability to leave ash behind, um, there's some evidence that there's some hope. But as I, as I mentioned in that bullet point, no tree is immune to us, right? If we're going to cut it down, then, then you know, it's, it's, it's gone. So thinking a little bit through, you know, is it worth trying to keep these trees around on the landscape? And, and there's certainly a lot of work looking into lingering ash and kind of how that, how that is linked to genetic structure and so forth. So given that we might possibly leave a few trees behind. Um, and there's very good ecological reasons for that. And, and certainly, um, you know, depending on a landowner and, and, you know, if they're not worried about trees falling down in certain parts of their forest in a given, given, uh, you know, given period of time, um, there's certainly some, some options for ash retention. And, and so if we're thinking about it from economics, you know, if, if there are trees that we know, you know, the next time we enter that stand, um, you know, there would be some, you know, growth into a, a higher product class. And at least I'm not sure what the case is in Maine, but what we're observing, at least over here with white ash, is that, you know, 16 inches and above is kind of what where the market is at this point, just given things got flooded quite a bit. Um, so, you know, it might have, you know, that's that small solid class, um, you know, certainly will be, you know, at least 15 years or so, depending on the growth rates that those species are into product classes that are worth worth looking at. Um, the, there's a question in the box about resistance between female and male trees. Um, there, I didn't. There hasn't been anything that I'm aware of on that front, um, and I'll, I'll mention it before. Actually, it's in here. Some of the lingering ash work. So um, some are some are familiar with um, the work work that Jennifer Cook has been doing uh, in, in Ohio, and certainly with Kathleen Knight and, and certainly Nate and others have been involved with evaluating some of these ash and particularly green ash um, that seem to stick around even when there is a a mass mortality, like I said, 95 to 97 percent of all the ash are dead, and a few are sticking around. Um, generally, like the key attribute of those trees is they have a really healthy crown. Um, so it seems to be more of a vigor-related um, uh, dynamic than, than anything else. And, and I don't know um, if Nate or others can speak to that, but there doesn't seem to be um, certainly a sex difference. And, and there's certainly been some discussion, at least initially, when there was some evidence of a resistance um, in, in some patches of, of black ash that sadly were no longer were, were proven to be not resistant where there's some 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 differences in bark morphology but ultimately those trees also were, were hit as well but um, the general attribute that i've at least seen from the work on lingering ash is it's, it's primarily related to a large healthy crown um, on those on those trees and and those of you that spend a lot of time looking at white ash large healthy crown is not often an attribute we associate with 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 ash and so um, it's, it's not going to always be a common common feature um, in the forest um, getting back to, you know, leaving trees behind, uh, you know, to my eyes, because some, some people already know I really love dead wood. I think it's a great thing to have in the forest. The more of it, the better. Um, but obviously, if that's next to a trail or next to a house or just not, you know, in, in the cards for that landowner in terms of their objectives, um, you know, there, there's certainly 
some trade-offs with leaving those trees behind and, and the safety risk that comes with um, standing dead trees and then ultimately um, dead trees falling on those sites. And so certainly factoring in safety with retention. And then finally, um, like I said, you know, with the ecological perspective, you know, if they are trees that we know bear seed, um, oftentimes ash is a very big tree in the forest. And so if there's not a lot of large tree habitat and that's the only individual that provides that and it's not a high quality timber um, species, that, you know, in that stand, you know, leaving it behind just for that value alone is quite important. And then again, um, for that lingering ash, having healthy trees um, seems to be kind of one key attribute. Again, th there's still plenty of healthy ash that end up getting killed by emerald ash borer, but that seems to be at least one attribute that, that links to it. So because of that, and, and in particular, I'm going to be I'm going to switch into talking about black ash or brown ash in, in a moment. But but one of the things that, that's fantastic, particularly um, in the state of Maine, and, and, and Nate's been involved with it, and I, I know that, that John and, um, and, and Tyler are on this as well, and, and others, Allison, you know, the, is that, you know, because of the novelty of this threat, um, certainly, you know, the cultural and ecological value, you know, just approaching this solely with insecticides or solely with biocontrol or solely with silviculture, you know, really doesn't seem like the most powerful way to deal with this. And, and so more and more, we're, we're starting to think through how do we kind of integrate and link with any type of integrated pest management that's happening in a region um, or opportunities to integrate some of these tools, particularly right now, certainly insecticides um, where, where appropriate um, are quite effective. And we're not talking about like in treating the entire stand of trees, but, you know, treating individual trees here and there or culturally significant trees, finding ways to link that with broader activities is, I think, becoming more and more important and, and certainly something that others on this call can, can talk through. But there has been some work going on for quite a while now on the Allegheny National Forest where they've been you know, deliberately kind of treating trees across the landscape and including those as part of, kind of a larger integrated strategy for thinking about ways to maintain ash out there beyond um, regeneration, also trying to keep mature um, seed sources out there. And this is, I think, most pertinent to um, as we're talking about uh, black ash. And so I, I think um, Mike wrote the question because he wanted me to talk about the state he used to live in and, and, the, and the mosquitoes that he misses. Um, but there was a question um, submitted that that asked about, you know, from, from Northern Maine, uh, dealing with areas with a high amount of, of black ash in the landscape. And so I've, I've shown a larger version now of, of, of Nate's uh, map of density of black ash trees. And so those of you that are, that are, are feeling um, overwhelmed and, and and, and you know, downtrodden about the, the black ash situation in, in Maine. Um, I, I put this map up just to know there's a there's a whole group of folks in, in, in the Midwest that are even um, more more freaked out about this in terms of what to do. And, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that that forest type. Um, you know, it's one that certainly we don't think about from a you know a timber a tradition a tr a timber products perspective. Um, you know, we really think about it more obviously from kind of a cultural perspective and, and using that as a resource for, for basket material and other cultural life ways. And so um, I'm not going to uh, expect anyone to, to do what they're doing in the lake states, but I'm going to show you at least how folks have been, been addressing kind of the challenge of, of working in landscapes and, and, and even in stands that have very high amounts of, of black ash in them. And I'll first talk a little bit about what we've learned about these areas from a, from a hydrologic perspective and what that might mean in terms of impacts of the AB, because that was one of the questions that that um, that Mike, Mike Ghost wrote um, that, that was submitted to me. And then I'll, then I'll get into at least some of the things folks are doing to approach this uh, and, then, and then kind of kind of wrap things up. So just to, again, it's it's silviculture. We always have to think about site first. And, and, and as I mentioned, when I was describing both white ash, I lumped black ash into this, um, even though we, we see, you know, black ash out there in the landscape and swamps, people often think these are stagnant and, and low productivity areas. Um, what, what's interesting about black ash is that it's actually pretty, pretty nutrient demanding um, and it's, it's very sensitive to pH. And, and again, I know some of you are already experts in this, but it's, it's not, you know, your typical swamp species. Um, particularly relative to some of the species that it occasionally associates with, like northern white, uh, white cedar. And so this is just showing kind of a gradient from like, you know, very well drained to not well drained at all, um, kind of waterlogging stress. And so, of course, well drained, you know, sugar maple likes that well. But as you kind of start gaining a little bit of, 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 of moisture, um, black ash occasionally will integrate with, with sugar maple. And then ultimately we get into the space where, where black ash exists. And so it's kind of a unique space in that. These are wet areas, but there still is water movement. Even those seeps that you might see black ash dominating 
um, there is water flow happening through those, even though it's not like a, a rivulet or a stream. Um, water is moving through those areas, um, you know, quite quite, you know, at, at a pace that's enough to keep those areas well oxygenated, and more importantly, um, to allow enough exchange with the surrounding environment that um, the pH is a little bit a little bit higher. It's you know slightly acidic, but really these circumneutral areas. We think of you know black ash really liking you know the pH is above five, um, so which which is which is more consistent with you know things like maple and other upland upland tree species. So so that that hydrology is quite important, and, and certainly maintaining that hydrology is quite important. So in the in the Midwest, and, and certainly in, in some parts of Maine, although I would argue that the, the least common um, in Maine are like these large kind of basins, like you know the, again those familiar with the the geology of, of the upper Midwest, there's huge glacial lake basins up there that are, you know, hundreds of square miles, very flat, um, where you have these large lowlands, both peatlands as well as um, black ash wetlands. Um, and so those are kind of one, what we call hydrogeomorphic setting where black ash will exist. But situations that you do have in Maine are more of these depressional wetlands, um, so kind of what we call swales um, or, or seeps, and then also transitional um, settings where, you know, black ash is existing either in a riparian transition from, from a river or a transition from a peatland or a transition from another forest type um, that's wet, um, where, where you'll see black ash kind of dominating that, that transition period. And so what you're looking at here for, for these figures is kind of the, the depth of the water table. So when it's above zero, you are better you better have your boots, let, let alone a canoe. Um, and then when it's below zero, kind of that water table is below uh, below the ground. And this is kind of over a growing season um, spanning. And, and, and what I have are, are three different years. And this is this is Minnesota. So 2006, as we all know, was a very dry year um, in the Northeast. But in, in Minnesota, this was a ridiculously wet year. So for all of these, you see this pattern where, you know, it's wet. You know, when, when the snow melts, you see water above ground. And then as those trees start growing, um, that water gets drawn down beneath the surface. And in these lowlands, it's pretty pronounced. But even in these swales, um, as well as in these transitional settings, you kind of see this, this seasonal dynamic. And again, all of us are, have observed this in the woods, where you're definitely avoiding that spot um, in, in May or June, but you might, might be able to walk across it um, by the time early August comes along. And what's interesting about this is if you look at this and link it to traditional uses of black ash, um, some work that Allaire Diamond did with, with Marla Emery, um, interviewing artisan ga uh, gatherers um, and talking to them about where they find the best basket grade black ash. Um, really kind of the traditional knowledge around this is that um, these kind of basin settings really aren't, aren't the places where um, the most quality ash are produced. Uh, really in, in, in our part of the world, when we're looking at kind of artisan quality um, black ash, so certainly having the growth rings and, and, and kind of the ability to be pounded in the splints, um, these are really in these primarily these transitional settings where you actually have some kind of drainage that's allowing that ash to grow at a fairly higher rate and produce that material. And so um, this, these settings really, as, as many of you know, do correspond to um, you know, where, where basket makers might be interested in, in thinking about harvesting um, trees from basket material. So the reason why a lot of folks uh, are concerned about black ash, and it's particularly in these basin settings, but but overall is that when you look at, and this is just another example of kind of the height of the water table, um, you know, throughout the growing season. So again, this is, you know, you better have boots on and then probably still want boots on, but you can maybe find the hummocks um, pretty, pretty effectively. Um, that when we see ash start to leaf out and, and use water, it's clear that that is kind of keeping these water tables stable. And, and the concern, and, and many of these concerns were actually, um, you know, highlighted by looking at former clear cuts or, or areas that had ash decline, um, where you lost that black ash transpiration, um, a lot of those areas kind of flooded out and became kind of a non-forest condition. So there's a lot of concern um, with a lot of black ash and brown ash as to how do we kind of sustain that ecological function if EAB is going to hit the hit those trees. So just to, to reinforce that with, with one final hydrograph, um, which is obviously not what we're talking about with the white ash in the uplands, but when we when we get into thinking about these lowlands, we have to factor in water water table dynamics. Um, this is just showing again groundwater table and then four different um, scenarios. Uh, so no harvest um, is, is, is this dark dark line here. So if you don't cut the trees, right, and they're still alive, there's no EAB. Obviously, it's using the water and drawing it down. Um, if you use group selection harvest, so this is uh, 10 thicker openings over 20% of the stand, um, you see kind of a similar dynamic. But if you kill those trees, either by preemptively clear cutting them or in the case of this study, they actually girdled all the trees to emulate emerald ash borer. 
it really leads to this increased saturation um, in the rooting zone, which um, you know may not be a huge deal for certain species, but for trees, it's a it's a big it's a game changer, right? A lot of our tree species really do not do well with um, saturated root systems, um, and so you know when we have that shift in hydrology, it can be quite quite dramatic. So what have they been doing in in other areas where this is occurring? Um, they've been doing some pretty pretty crazy stuff, um, and and I and I would say historically this was largely being driven um, you know by some research and also some concerns initially from the Chippewa National Forest uh, where, where they were really kind of sat in the middle of a large acreage of of, of ash, but this has spread um, quite w widely, and they can speak to this certainly as well. But now e equip funds are being used um, in the lake states to to pay for seedlings and, and underplanting and diversification efforts um, to actually increase the representation of non-ash species in these wetlands. And so some of the work we've been doing out there, looking at a whole range of different things, um, including Manchurian ash, which as I was talking with, with Mike before we started here, was included um, per the recommendation of, of Mike Benedict, uh, the brother of Les Benedict, who some of you may know, um, who works for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and um, is an Akwesasne um, Mohawk member. Um, and, and Manchurian ash was included because they actually were able to a pound splints out of that for making baskets. And so the idea was maybe this would be an alternative um, you know, source for, for basket material um, if EAV comes through. But we also included a lot of native species. Um, and, and overall, at least in this study, we're seeing this is uh, American elm that's been bred. Um, so it's a valley forage variety crossed with a local seed source. So there's some level of, of um, uh, tolerance to, to Dutch elm disease, but it's not, not purely resistant. But also species like swamp white oak. Here's a picture of one right here um, growing out in an ash swamp. So a lot of effort going on. Um, this, these are some photos from Wisconsin where folks are planting sycamore and riparian areas. Um, this is from the Fond du Lac um, Reservation um, in, in Minnesota where they're doing a lot of underplanting in their their black ash swamps to try to diversify them. So so it's certainly um, a bit different, you know, in terms of how folks are approaching this out there, and, and a lot of concern over trying to diversify that. Um, that resource. Um, and it, like I said, NRCS funds being applied to it um, at this point as well. So if you were to consider doing this, um, again, I'm, the only reason I'm talking about this is because that question folks were wondering what have other people done with, with these areas uh, elsewhere. Um, you know, so if you're planting into these areas, uh, there's a, there's certainly some considerations and as many would, would imagine micro topography matters quite a bit. And so some work that um, we did in these areas is use kind of high resolution LIDAR um, to map kind of the micro topography um, in these swamps. And, and so this, this, these, these images in the bottom, um, any colored portion um, is a hummock. And if they share the same color, it's kind of the same hummock complex. So anything with a unique um, color is a, is a distinct hummock um, in terms of their, their connection to each other. And so what we found, as most would expect, is when you, you find these hummocks um, in these, these areas, those tend to be kind of more favorable microsites in general for tree growth. And so preferentially planting into those areas seems to result in kind of two times the level of success for, for seedlings. And some of these sites, again, those that have spent time around these seepage swamps, occasionally you don't have a lot of microtopography, and so you might not have that luxury of being able to just put, put seedlings in the best microsite. But again, not saying people should be doing this in Maine, but others are, are certainly are, are attempting this and, and using it in other parts of the, the range of, of black ash where you have these, these dominated areas. They are also do a lot of uh, harvesting um, in, in lowland settings. Uh, and so if, if you were thinking about it again, not saying you should, but they have been certainly doing this in, in, in Wisconsin and in Minnesota where there also are, are large acreages of, of, of black ash. And in general, you know, instead of planting uh, they're looking at kind of natural regeneration and non-ash species and and black ash is pretty unique in, in these these swamp forests it actually is pretty tolerant of shade um you know and, and can do quite well in small openings and so what they've generally found is that when you do things like strip shelter woods where you know you're still retaining some of that ash overstory to keep that water table down um, but also creating enough light for other species to recruit um, it's been pretty effective at getting non-ash regenerating as well as keeping keeping ash in the landscape so this is a picture of a, a clear cut. Oops, go back a sec. Oh, wrong way. Uh, clear cut uh, ash stand, and, and you can see here there's certainly ash stump sprouts um, that are going to you know persist. But but in general, the rest of this is primarily um, the, uh, marsh like vegetation. You're not going to have any other trees uh, growing out there. So a final comment on um, black ash, and again. Uh, to show, throw a huge plug to what's happening in Maine, certainly at the University of Maine with others, and see Allison and, and John's pictures on that screen uh, 
shot that uh, that Amanda took uh, from a previous meeting, uh, looking at the main uh, black ash task force. Uh, you know, this is a species again that that you know, I view as as, as the, the biggest impact of EAB. You know, really the importance of that species um, to both the you know the culture, but also the ecology of our landscape. You know, we don't think of black ash as the, the, the you know prime prime timber crop of our region, and so. Because of that, you know, we really need to be thinking through are there are there unique strategies, and again, Tyler Everett's on this call too. That you know, he's been he's been certainly helped coordinate, you know, ash seed collections and and protecting ash in some places, and and also thinking about underplanting where it makes sense. But but really taking a unique approach to this resource, just given you know how outsized its importance is um, to the region, and and so silviculture certainly is one part of the toolbox. But this is one where I think we need to be. Um, and, and thankfully, others in Maine are already thinking through, like, how do we uh, keep this as part of our landscape? And most importantly, keep it as part of, um, you know, the cultural, um, you know, traditions of, of, the, of the indigenous people throughout throughout Maine and really throughout um, the range of that species. So I'll end uh, with just a broad comment that this is not the, sadly, the last insect and disease that's going to show up that's new in Maine. Um, and obviously, you've been coping with beach bark disease for a long time, and, and certainly, you know, adapting to that and, and, and the impacts of that. But, um, you know, the EAB is definitely another example of why having diverse forests and thinking about how kind of resilience broadly is a good good objective. Uh, many are familiar with the statistics from Gary Lovett. You know, 2.5 new forest pests introduced per year. Um, you know, half of those are, are, are kind of high impact or have the potential to be high impact, and so. Um, it's not going away, and, and, and despite all of our best efforts to contain um, EAB and, and, and do good jobs inspecting, um, you know, imports and so forth, it, it, it's just a challenge. And so we need to be thinking about you know, diversifying and, and, and how to do this. But you know, I think you know, with EAB and other threats, you know, as I said at the beginning, you know, you still want to be looking at it as a forest, right? It's a forest that's threatened by something new, and how do I sustain the values of that forest in the context of this threat? And so doing it in a way that doesn't kind of compound or make that impact even greater by just, you know, wantingly harvesting ash out of the site. You know, we want to be thinking about what the overall impacts are. And most importantly, you know, as much as, you know, it, it pays our bills from a research perspective that, yeah, we need more science to help, you know, figure out strategies to deal with these threats. These threats and kind of th their impacts really outpace any type of kind of surefire method we can come up with to contain EAB or any other novel novel stressor. And so there's such importance of just building these communities of practice that already exist in Maine, where people are sharing information and talking to one another and trying things out and and figuring out ways to really sustain this resource and sustain the values of Maine's forest, um, while also grappling with you know the impacts of the thermal ash borer across the landscape. And so, um, with that said, I really appreciate the opportunity to get to present today and certainly um, learn from all of you and, and Nate and others on kind of what what folks are doing, um, as well as to to get get my, my act straightened out on, on, on mites versus versus insects. Um, so I'll, I'll stop with that um, and, and certainly, um, you know, folks have questions and also I know Nate can, can um, if he's got things to chime in and, and straighten me out even more on, on entomological aspects, that, that'd be great.